Small businesses are so on the rope right now. And I, I wanted to ask you about this a little bit because, you know, in, in some of the reading and writing that I've been doing, like we found that there's been just a massive transfer of of revenue, of commerce, of wealth. You know, you have some of these companies like Amazon um, and Square and and Apple and all these huge behemoth companies. Apple, the companies. $2 trillion company. Yeah. And yet small businesses, our data shows that small businesses are down on average about 20 plus percent and 30 percent have permanently closed at this point, And that's growing. And what I worry about and I want to know what you think about this is how do we put that genie back in the bottle? Because the trend just seems really hard right now. You need to dramatically rebalance the economy if you're going to give small businesses a chance to reopen or open a new uh, so you would need something like universal basic income, honestly, to have a shot because you have Apple breaking two trillion. You have Amazon just sucking so many businesses dry. Well, and I think the other complicating factor that we all need to learn together is how does that process of change actually happen? Because I think we get this wrong. I think that there's a certain segment of the population right now that thinks like demonizing Joe Biden or Donald Trump will make that change happen. But we've had plenty of politicians do really shitty things that were worthy of demonization many times in the past, and that didn't really fix it. And I think, if anything, we need to try to find a way to rise above those things and really talk to each other. So, you know, for me, being from rural Idaho, a lot of the people that I grew up with are, tr are Trump MAGA people um, or they're libertarians or they're people that are kind of predisposed to not necessarily... Uh, want to join some of these solutions like what you're talking about. And what I'm finding is when I actually just see them as a human being that's flawed the way I am, that's learning the way I am, and have a conversation and don't try to kind of like extricate them from my life because our beliefs don't line up or the way we vote doesn't line up, and I just listen to them, we actually can influence each other and come together. And I think, you know, we need to be careful because right now the, the, the predominant way of persuasion is kind of by like shaming and bullying each other. And I don't know if that's going to get people into the fold of something like this. I'm pretty and, sure it's not, Dan. <laughs> and, and as you've shown for, for a long time and we're all seeing in real time, unfortunately, right now, like we need these changes. These changes are not really optional if we want to protect our way of life, which means using a suboptimal form of connection, persuasion, influence, whatever you want to call it. I don't know that we can afford to do that right now. And so I think a lot of people kind of on the liberal side of the equation, you know, need to soften up and engage a little bit more and not be so kind of like harsh and mean sometimes. Or, or maybe even find a different way to uh, frame some of the changes that we're making. You know, it's one reason why uh, we christened universal basic income the freedom dividend is because it tested better with broader swaths of the population. <laughs> yeah. I liked other. it. Yeah, Ooh. it was hard for me to switch back. I liked it that much. And now we're kind of back to basic income. Uh, and I actually loved the the freedom dividend as a branding, as a way of explaining it. And well, I, I thank really you, Dan. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it, it is kind of funny. Um, but I, I think that language really helped that make the case to different types of people. There could be some of your uh, old neighbors in rural Idaho would be like, I'm down with the freedom dividend. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's like, it's a, uh, and, and what, what you're describing as like the, the barriers between us and trying to make the case to different types of people, just like you have these market incentives around how companies treat their workers. Unfortunately, there are market incentives around politics where uh, political figures get rewarded more for ginning up like a passionate group of people uh, on a particular side than they do in reaching out and uh, solving problems. And that's going to destroy us, but but it, it's baked into um, the way a lot of candidates have to run, where they're much more concerned about getting primary, primaried by someone in their district because they're a safe seat uh, than they are in reaching to out to different types of people. I mean, I, I've been trying to write and encourage people lately, like, hey, like, I get that there's a lot of horrible things happening, but like putting some focus on the solutions, putting some focus on the changes that we want to have happen is really our best bet in this situation more so than the, you know, latest scandal that's going to keep us kind of all ginned up for an extra week or two. Like these folks who are trying to turn us against each other, like just ignore them. Like the fact is we know how to solve our problems. Like you get it. I get it. We're 
pretty much like the the same we have the same motivations like let, let's just come together and get this thing done well now 55 percent of americans are for universal basic income and it's something like 76 percent are for cash relief during the pandemic which i have to say is going to be uh a natural lead into universal basic income uh, so, so Dan, what's fascinating is I feel like you and I were kind of early on this, but now many, many millions of Americans have joined us. And now the big challenge is, is how the heck do we restore the connection between people and lawmakers where if enough of us want something, it actually happens. Uh, and, yeah. and so that's something I'm now engaged with very directly because I see that the mechanics of our democracy are actually going to be um, something we have to solve for. And that also includes our media, our social media. It's, it's interesting, but I now think that that's going to be um, one of the foremost challenges to trying to have something like universal basic income pass. Can you give me a little bit of the playbook on that? Because that'll help me to be out there, you know, like walking the walk, talking the talk with you. Sure. Uh, so the, the first big move would be something around democracy reform, like ranked choice voting. So if you have ranked choice voting, then people will uh, be able to vote uh, more dynamically. Uh, you know, they, they, they wouldn't feel like they were going to like waste their vote. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you would make, let's call it, uh, you know, really either Democrats or Republicans more responsive to different types of people in their district, because instead of just having to worry about <laughs> like someone primarying them, it, it could be that there are a couple of different points of view that they have to account for. And yeah. so if you're pro-democracy, then ranked choice voting ought to be like a, a, a near absolute good. Yeah. Uh, and, and so and it doesn't seem particularly partisan because it's not. It's like, look, we should just try and improve our democracy so it works better and it's more representative. Uh, and you can make very compelling arguments to people on, on either side um, uh, that this would just be a better form of voting. Uh, so that's one big thing that I, I'm going to be pushing and championing because it's like a process change that strikes people as reasonable on both sides. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm right there with you, and I, I completely agree. I, I think also, you know, getting money out of politics is just we got to figure out a way. I know with the Supreme Court decision, it's just really hard, but like we just have to do it because it's going to kill us. That's exactly the, the kind of change that we need to, to make. So I was proposing, as you know, 100 democracy dollars for every uh, citizen so that you can just give it to your favorite candidate and then all of a sudden we could wash out the corporate money so that's a massive change that we need in the worst way uh i'm for term limits for legislators because i just think it's too easy for someone to go to dc and then just make it all about preserving their spot and like climbing this ladder and the ladder unfortunately stretches up for decades so yeah. if if you dan let's say you were to do something bold and run for congress then and win and you know I'm, i i would encourage this actually uh <laughs> though you have a business to run the rest of it but uh if you were to show up there then they'd be like all right now you're a low man on the totem pole go like dial for dollars and if you play your cards right maybe you'll wind up on one of these awesome committees in like eight years or, <laughs> or, or, or something like that uh and, and so that that that's not helping us solve these problems uh, and so I think uh, we should have term limits so that members of Congress see it as a term of service and not like career. And then you go there yeah. and try and get something done and you turn around. Now, there is a balancing act. Um, but to me, that that's necessary uh, because right now we have something of a gerontocracy where the average member of Congress, I believe, is about 62 years old, um, which makes them a little bit behind the curve on technology issues, among other things. But but um, their, their incentives aren't around solving our problems so much as they are staying where they are. Mm. And, and that is something that we need to address if we're going to make progress. So, that, so these are some of the systemic fixes um, I'm going to be pushing for um, in the days to come. And hopefully that message, first it's needed, but hopefully that message uh, is so loud and powerful that we can override like you know the the software like you know and, yeah. and and in your case the in my case it was like you know it's like the political software and the media software and the rest of it that we have to try and override um yeah. and the interests uh, you know in dc and the rest of it uh in, in economy-wide though it, it, it's true that corporations the the logic of corporations will grind us to dust it will end up turning us into just like these these cogs in the machine and the machine will eventually discard us Thank you for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, 
Please do subscribe to Yang Speaks and click on notifications so we can let you know every time we have a new episode.